Hello and thanks for joining us from our studios in Israel. Coming up in today's newscast, the IDF searches for a Gazan missile in southern Israel. ILTV gets an inside look at what's happening to all of Israel's leftover food. And football fans get ready because Israel is about to welcome 12 players from the NFL. I'm Natasha Kirchuk here with the latest news in Israel. Security forces are searching southern Israel for the remnants of a missile shot into the state by terrorists in Gaza this morning. As a Hamas spokesperson vowed there will be an even greater escalation of violence in the near future. Fortunately, no Israelis were hurt in the attack. The Israeli army immediately retaliated by firing tank rounds at Hamas targets in the northern Gaza Strip. The latest outbreak of terrorist shelling comes as a senior defense official is warning that the Islamist group has been able to completely restock its weapons arsenal and restore its fighting abilities, left depleted in its 2014 conflict with Israel. A spokesperson for the terrorists' military wing is declaring today that the level of Israeli concern proves Hamas's success during the 50 days of fighting. The Hamas mouthpiece then boasted that even larger forces will fall in the near future. Meanwhile, in related news, tens of thousands of dollars of Hamas cash, jewelry, vehicles, and other valuables were confiscated from the families of seven terrorists in Jerusalem. Fourteen Arab suspects were taken into custody during the raid that was launched by Israeli security forces in several Arab neighborhoods. The seized property is all believed to be part of the reward system Hamas gives to the families for their relatives' acts of terror against Jews. Before the launching of today's rocket from Gaza, Israel has been advancing a multi-pronged economic plan to improve life in the Palestinian territory in return for three Israeli civilians and the remains of two IDF soldiers being held by Hamas. The proposal reportedly includes a solution to the entity's power crisis, as well as the entry of Gazans seeking employment into the Jewish state. It's also believed to favor the creation of a free trade zone in the northern Sinai Peninsula on Egyptian territory, and the building of an industrial zone near Israel's border with Gaza, under the security of the IDF. Third parties such as the United Nations and representatives of Arab states like Qatar are said to be mediating the Israeli offer. Even though Hamas is said to be interested in the economic benefits, the Times of Israel is reporting that the Gaza rulers are operating under the impression they only have to uphold the ceasefire with Israel. The group has long insisted that it will not agree to any kind of a deal until hundreds of Palestinians are released from Israeli jails. But Jerusalem officials are making it clear that none of the incentives will be implemented until two mentally unstable Israelis being held captive in Gaza are returned. They're also demanding that Hamas hand over the bodies of IDF soldiers Oron Shaul and Hadal Goldin, who the Israeli army has determined were killed in action in the 2014 conflict with Gaza. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is in London today for meetings with his British counterpart Theresa May. Topping the two leaders' talks will be ways to form a joint response to confront Iran. Upon his departure for the United Kingdom, the Premier said he's hoping to craft a U.S.-led tripartite response to Iran's missile testing. Netanyahu's talks with Britain's Prime Minister come just ahead of his first White House visit with American President Donald Trump on February 15th. We are in a period of international and also of challenges. The challenges come from that there is a new ממשלה חדשה בבריטניה, אני מתכוון uh, לדבר עם שניהם על הידוק היחסים גם uh, בין כל צד וישראל וגם uh, במשולש. זה מה שאני אעשה בשבוע הבא בוושינגטון וזה מה שאני עושה מחר בלונדון. האתגרים נובעים מכך שגם האיראנים מבינים את מה שאמרתי עכשיו והם מנסים לבדוק את הגבולות בתוקפנות uh, בלתי רגילה עם uh, חוצפה והתרסה uh, יוצאי דופן. אני חושב שהדבר החשוב ביותר כרגע הוא שמדינות כמו ארצות הברית, בהובלתה, 
אבל כמו ישראל ובריטניה יתייצבו יחד נגד התוקפנות האיראנית ויציבו לה גבולות ברורים. זה יהיה הנושא הראשון בין נושאים רבים שאני אדבר עם ראש ממשלת בריטניה תרזה מיי וכמובן גם עם שר החוץ של בריטניה בוריס ג'ונסון. Netanyahu is expected to focus on ways to drum up support for a harder line to be taken against the rogue regime, as well as a 2015 international nuclear deal it signed with six world powers despite Israeli condemnation. Netanyahu has long insisted the pact will only pave Iran's path towards atomic weapons development, when key restrictions expire 15 years after being implemented. While he's in the United Kingdom, the Israeli leader says other topics of discussion will include security, trade, and technology ties between the two countries. Also on the agenda are efforts to resurrect Middle East peace efforts. There's a lot of uncertainty here in Israel today over whether or not the Knesset will be voting on the controversial settlement bill later this evening. If passed, the legislation permits the Israeli appropriation of West Bank land. But before taking off for London, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has refused to confirm reports that he's asked for a delay of the vote until after he meets with U.S. President Donald Trump. Now, Aaron, why the secrecy? Well, politically, Netanyahu is in a pretty tough spot. The international community is condemning the, the settlements and the settlement bill. Uh, he, but at the same time, he has a duty to his constituents, to the people who need housing, to the people who uh, voted for him, to his coalition. So I think he's really just uh, trying to get a feel for where the U.S. stands before making any decision either way. The premier is believed to have told his cabinet that he wants to coordinate the issue with the Trump administration. Although just hours earlier, he was said to have informed his only Likud party ministers that the second and third votes on the bill will take place as scheduled. The Knesset has to approve all proposed legislation three times before it can become law, and the regulation bill narrowly passed its first reading last week. Even if Netanyahu did ask for a postponement, far-right lawmakers are vowing to move ahead with the vote anyway. The law would retroactively authorize several thousand homes in Israeli West Bank settlements. Palestinian landowners would be generously compensated with up to 125% of the property's value, and there would be no more demolitions of illegally built Israeli homes. The law cannot be applied to areas already ruled on by the courts, such as Amona, however, that was dismantled last week, or in the nine homes of the Ofra settlement slated for evacuation. The High Court of Justice just delayed the Ofra demolitions for another month, saying it hopes the extra time will allow the demolition to be carried out peacefully. A short time after the ruling, 5,000 protesters gathered in the settlement, where many said they're planning to go on a hunger strike if the regulation bill isn't passed. Speakers fiercely condemned the destruction of any Jewish homes in their biblical homeland. Those gathered are vowing to continue settling the land of Israel amid hopes that the Prime Minister's mission to elicit greater support for their enterprise from the Trump administration is successful. As we've reported on several occasions, Israel is at the forefront of the research and production of medical cannabis, and now the country is preparing to share its superior product line with the world. Israel's Justice Minister has just announced that the Cabinet's Committee on Legislation is greenlighting a proposal to export cannabis grown in the Jewish state for medical use. That step is required before the bills turned over to the Knesset for official endorsement although no date for voting on the matter has yet been set. The Agriculture Ministry is now allocating $2 million to medical cannabis research projects. This follows the $20 million investment made by the American tobacco firm Philip Morris in the production of precision inhalers for the substance by the Israeli Sky Company. At least 25,000 patients in Israel are authorized to use the drug to help alleviate side effects from the treatment of cancer, epilepsy, post-traumatic stress, or degenerative diseases. While Israel has permitted the therapeutic usage of marijuana over the last decade, it's still illegal for personal use. Public Security Minister Gilad Erdan is now advancing efforts to decriminalize a product for recreational purposes, although the scheduled government debate on his initiative was just pushed off to next Sunday. It's strongly believed that the Israeli Justice Minister will also support the measure.
One of the scariest things about going under the knife is wondering whether or not you'll come back out of it breathing. Well, one Israeli company has created a device that will make sure that every patient is taken care of. Joining me in the studio today to talk about his company's product is CEO and co-founder of Guidin Medical, Ariel Schrem. Thank you so much for coming in. Thank you for having me. All right, so let's begin. What does your product do? Okay, so before I'll talk about the device we're developing, maybe I'll describe uh, the medical need that we're trying to solve. So um, intubation is a basic and elementary procedure uh, in medicine. It's the third most common procedure performed in the US. And basically, whenever we need to ventilate a patient, uh, the physician or paramedic who intubates requires to locate the, patient, the patient's trachea and insert to there and a breathing tube. Now, just beneath the trachea, we have the esophagus, which leads to the stomach. The uh, trachea leads to the uh, lungs. So the core challenge in the procedure is to distinguish between the two of them. And usually, we need to do it under time and uh, pressure because the patient does not breathe during right. the, the procedure. Because this isn't only for surgery. It's just going to be somebody who's gotten into a car accident or yeah. passed it on the it's street. It's going to be, uh, it's, it's, it's possible to, uh, to intubate either in the field or even inside the hospital, inside the operating room. Right. It's very common. Which is why this is one of the most common uh, yeah. procedures in the yeah, world. It is. Okay, so like you said, it's, it's the third most performed medical procedure in the U.S. Now, how did you come, what is this product that you've created though? What does it do exactly? How does it make that procedure easier? Well, first of all, I encountered, encountered this uh, uh, problem uh, during my military service as an airborne uh, medic in uh, Unit 669, the uh, airborne rescue unit of uh, the IDF. And basically, uh, our product is uh, a new uh, method to perform uh, intubation. It's um, a guided intubation device, an innovative non-invasive device, which uh, you basically uh, place upon the patient's neck. Okay. Once activated, the device transmits a very specific light in a very certain wavelength to the underlying tissues of the patient. Wow. And we discover that uh, once the uh, physician uses video scopes that he has uh, in the hospital, he can actually see the light coming out from the trachea, but not from the surrounding tissues, especially not from the esophagus. So in other words, uh, we guide, we actively guide the physician where to go in real time. Wow. And I can, you know, you can imagine facing uh, uh, two tunnels, two dark tunnels, and you're not sure where to go. So we actually uh, turn the light in the end of the correct tunnel and show uh, the correct path. Okay, so when and where will this product be available? Well, we are now seeking uh, the CE mark in Europe and the FDA approval in the US. And along the way, uh, the NGT incubator team has really helped us a lot. So uh, we hope that uh, in the end of this year, this product will be out there in the market. And I'm certain that it's going to change lots of lives. Thank you so Me much too. for coming in. Thank you. Now, imagine walking along the sand dunes of a nature reserve and suddenly seeing the turret of a tank sticking out at you. Well, that's what just happened to one Israeli youngster who immediately called the police. After rushing to the site, the officers realized it was a very old vehicle, long ago forgotten at the Nitzanim Nature Reserve in southern Israel. While extricating the tank, which was filled with the sands of time, the security services also discovered an old landmine as well as an old explosive shell. But they say they don't believe either are connected to the tank. After being carefully extracted by police sappers, both were safely destroyed in a controlled explosion. As for the tank, an Israeli police spokesperson says it's believed to be even older than the state of Israel, which was established in 1948. Now experts will examine the vehicle and try to find out just who left it behind so long ago. Just a few weeks ago, the police got a similar call from a Tel Aviv museum where a 90-year-old live grenade was discovered stashed in a cupboard. It was later determined to have been made in the 1920s for early underground forces fighting for the independence of the Jewish state. If you'd like to see it, you actually can, because after being diffused, it's actually been returned to the Haganah Museum, which explores the pre-state Jewish military force that ultimately became the Israeli army. 
I know, I know everybody, the Super Bowl is over, it's rough, but Israel still has a reason to celebrate American football. A group of top NFL players are set to visit the Holy Land next week and will be traveling across the country from Haifa to the Black Hebrew community in the southern city of Dimona. The 12-strong delegation includes players like Cliff Averill, Michael Bennett, Michael Kendricks, and Cameron Jordan, and even includes the ESPN commentator and former linebacker Kirk Morrison. Israeli officials hope the visit will give the players a chance to get a more balanced picture of Israel and clear up any false narratives about the state. Plus, the football stars will have the chance to show off their moves in Jerusalem by holding an exhibition game with players from the Israeli Football Association on February 18th. We've all heard our parents say it, finish your meal, there are kids starving around the world. Well, it may actually be time to take their advice and start thinking about what you're doing with your leftovers. What's wrong with this lemon, or these oranges? Not much, right? Well, you may be surprised, but all of the produce you're seeing right here would be thrown out if it weren't for one Israeli organization called Leket. One billion people around the world lack access to the food they need to get proper nutrition, and it turns out 1.5 million of them live here in Israel. Now, what's crazy is that 1.3 billion tons of food goes to waste every year around the world. And most of us have seen this happen in restaurants. If you've ever worked in the food industry, you see what happens in the kitchen behind the scenes. And if you've ever gone to a party, you see how much food ends up being wasted by the end of the night. And you know, that's only a small part. But the Israeli organization Leket has made it their mission to solve this issue here in Israel. And now we're going to go check it out. Let's go. Take a look at what you have to offer. This is one of Leket's distribution centers, which handles tons of the leftover produce from Israeli farmers across the country that can be used to feed people in need. Last year, we distributed about 20,000 tons of food. So that means about 20, 400 tons. tons a week, which means, let's say five days a week, 80 to 100 tons a day, assuming five days a week. 33% of all food produced in Israel goes to waste. 2.4 million tons with a value of 19 and a half billion shekels. It's preposterous that we hear so much about people who are hungry when we as a society are wasting such staggering amounts of food. So Leket simply says, enough. We need to figure out how to get this food. I know what you're thinking. How is it possible that there's so much produce going to waste on a daily basis? Okay, so let's get a sense of some of the other products we're getting our hands on. Pomelos. Now, can you tell me what's... I just picked out one, there's a lot in there, but what's wrong with this? Nothing. nothing. The answer is nothing, but it's a little small, okay? It's a little small, and that's why it's not gonna make it to marketplace. Sweet potatoes. Now this is interesting, okay? Not beautiful, right? But you know what? All you gotta do is take a knife, just cut that piece off. Will this ever get to a supermarket? Not in a million years. Nothing wrong with it. Why feed it to the cows? We can feed it to human beings. I would feed this to my kids. There you go, you're gonna love this. I've been told that only Russians use carrots like this. Because <laughs> we have a farmer, we have a farmer we work with, and we said, why don't you donate any to Lekin? He had these carrots like this, and he said, oh, I found a market in Russia. I shipped them to Russia. Mutant cauliflower. You know why? You're never going to see this in a supermarket, right? It's a little bit, it's not perfect, right? It's a little... But I mean, it's just more bang for your buck, right? Yeah. <laughs> I get enough uh, people telling me is the food you're serving in your house from Leket, so I don't need to uh, add fuel to the fire. But it's not always how vegetables and fruit look that make them end up in the waste basket or Leket's hands. Well, sometimes the price in the market is low, and farmers have picked some stuff that's made it to packing houses, and even then, 
when it comes, comes time to sell it, the truck to deliver it to the supermarket chain might actually cost them more than they're gonna get paid. That doesn't happen all the time. That's still a small percentage of what's going on in the agricultural industry. But if it's five or 10% of the output, you're talking about hundreds of thousands of tons just in Israel a year where this is going on. I mean, look at how beautiful these fruits and vegetables are. They're being thrown off by companies across the country. The amount of waste that's taking place on a daily basis is mind boggling. And I want to take some of this stuff home myself and make a salad. <laughs> Now, like it doesn't only deal with produce. The organization also sources already made food that just didn't make it onto people's plates in restaurants, hotels, and even in the army. We have an agreement with the army. Every army base is open to Leket, theoretically. We're in about 50 already. Now that we've had the chance to see the food that Leket has to offer, we decided to head over to a soup kitchen in central Tel Aviv to see how this food is being distributed to those in need. Ilan is a manager of La Sova Soup Kitchen and he says the majority of the food they serve comes from Leket. הם חסרי ממון, וחלקם הגדול הוא חסרי דיור, מה שנקרא הומלסים. ואין להם, אין להם מקום אחר לאכול. ולפחות הארוחה החמה אחת ביום אנחנו נותנים. לפחות שיהיה להם ארוחה אחת חמה. אנחנו לא שואלים ולא בודקים בציציות מי יש לו, מי אין לו, אנחנו פשוט מקבלים את כולם. The soup kitchen is open from 10.30 a.m. to 2 p.m. six days a week, and visitors can take as much food as they need. Even then, the workers here say there's still food left over. This is an example of one of the daily meals here at La Sova Soup Kitchen. You can see there's rice, meat, vegetables. A lot of this food has already been prepared and like it picks it up from different hotels, um, army bases where it's left over and brings it here to be heated up. But some of it is actually cooked on the spot with fresh vegetables and fresh meat that is provided by Leket to the soup kitchen. So you have soup, uh, like I said, vegetables, meat, bread, basically everything that you would need for a, a healthy meal, a filling meal, and something that will last you for at least half of the day. It might just be time for you to start thinking about what you're doing with your own leftovers. With over 2 million Israelis living under the poverty line, there's just no reason that 2.4 million tons of edible food goes to waste in Israel every year. Luckily, there is a way you can help by volunteering at Leket, Israel's National Food Bank. For more information, go to www.leket.org. All right, now for our Hebrew word of the day. After learning about the amazing work of the Leket organization, we thought we'd also take the opportunity to define their name. So today's word is Leket, meaning gleaning. Leket comes from the Torah in Leviticus 23.22 where God commanded that the farmers allow the poor to glean food that falls from the tree to make sure that the weak will never go hungry. It's with that attitude that the Leket organization and many others like it feed the needy. It's no coincidence then that Leket can also mean a collection. Maybe one of the greatest things about Leket is that it's one of the easiest kinds of generosity around. You're not really even losing anything, and when everyone is taken care of, everyone wins. So next time you're on your way home with leftovers, give someone that Leket. Even better, maybe get them a meal of their own, open your hearts, and you'll see that there'll always be enough Leket to go around. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at the weather forecast. ILTV's weather forecast is sponsored by Adopt-a-Safta taking care of Israel's lonely Holocaust survivors. Tonight should be clear to partly cloudy with a low of 49 or 9 degrees Celsius. You can expect tomorrow to be sunny with a slight rise in temperatures to a high of 75 or 24 degrees Celsius. 
All right, that's it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.75 shekels to the American dollar. Remember to sign up for our daily newsletter at ILTV.tv. Thanks for watching and see you tonight.